We'll be starting on page four, your little booklet. If anyone doesn't have one, we can get you one. Before we do that, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. If you'd pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful again that Thou spared our lives, that we can be together on this first day of the week and in this Bible class. We're thankful for all those who've come out to study the Bible and the various teachers in the classes. Gracious Father, may we lend our mind always to study Thy Word with full intent to learn our duties to Thee, that we might be faithful and well-pleasing in Thy sight. We pray in the hour to follow that we will center our mind on Thee and worshiping Thee in spirit and in truth, that we will be mindful of the strength we gain as we, as one mind and one purpose, worship Thee according to Thy will. Throughout the week, help us to be mindful of our duties to Thee and yielding our bodies living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service. May we encourage one another to live the Christian life. May we be there in our fellowship one with another to lean on one another in times of sorrow and sickness. May we ever be praying for one another and striving to love each other more, helping each other go to heaven. Holy Father, be with the leaders of this nation and state and federal and local government and the nations of the world that the overruling providence will have things working in such a way as the church will have peace and that the gospel will have free course. May we be more thankful and to count our many blessings and name them one by one. God of mercy, help us to be merciful. Help us to care for those who need the gospel and prepare ourselves to teach them the truth and to defend it. Guide us on through this study, on through life. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Does anyone have any questions over what we'll call the first, the material that we've brought out in the first three pages of this. I think we've discussed sitting the, as much as we could in what we would call a survey or introductory course on right and dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, or uh, what saith the scriptures. There's so much, I hope you're seeing and looking at what we picked here that this just opens the door in every one of those areas for further study on your part and uh, laying down some basic understanding of things that, that can be fully, more fully developed as you go through your own personal Bible study. And again, I want to say, though, it's been said many, many times that uh, this class or any other class that the church has will not take the place of your own day-by-day -day study of the Bible, your own personal reading and study of the Bible. And I want to encourage you to have a time in which you just read the Bible. Now you say, well, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. Well, there is. There's need of looking up words, all those things we talk about that are needful to write and divide the word of truth. But one of the things that that you must remember these letters that make up the Bible, I'm thinking now particularly of the New Testament, were meant to be read before an assembly. Uh, they were meant to be understood by the ordinary person of the day in which they were written and to the people to whom they were addressed. And of course they had time to explain things and discuss things. But nevertheless, you begin studying by being able to read I can't emphasize that enough, but being able to read. Paul said, when you read what I wrote, you'll know what I know regarding, really, the, I summed up this way, the whole scheme of redemption, what he has con specifically concerning his knowledge of salvation. Reading is the beginning of study. One of the things that International Paper Company had where my father worked for 35 years, it was impressed upon me because daddy loved to read. Uh, but their motto was, give me a man who reads. Now think about that for a minute. If you read, you open up the world to you. Now, comprehension is something else. I understand that. But the idea of reading takes in or should imply comprehension. What do you read except to understand to comprehend? I can't emphasize that enough. The other thing is familiarity with the text. You can read, simply become familiar with the text. You may not remember book, chapter, and verse, but you'll remember the text. 
And that's so very important. Uh, I, I can't emphasize that enough. So begin, read, 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 think as you read, remember the text, the text becomes familiar. Now, you can start honing that more by looking at words, understanding the, all of those particular things. And uh, people want to jump right over to the Greek. Well, I admit that's a good thing, but uh, you can't just dabble in the original languages and expect to benefit from it. Sometimes it uh, can cause more trouble than it can help. So if you're going to do that, it's one thing to study the, the uh, meaning of a given Greek word, but it's quite another thing to get into the grammar of it. Uh, that's just a, <laughs> I guess a great deal of difference. And uh, I really don't recommend uh, most people, unless they have a knack for it, and I, I, I've always believed this, that people who are good at any language, modern language, whatever, uh, they tend to have a, a natural ability to do that and uh, know what you're capable of doing and what appeals to you. But I'm telling you now, I. Right now, John's the only one I can appeal to who's been to a Greek course. When you start getting into the grammar in Greek, it is so different from the grammar of English. The, the language doesn't even work like, like our English works. And, I, and I'll leave this right after I do this. Uh, I want a drink of water. You have to have that in that form. It has to be in that form in English. It doesn't in Greek. You can have words all over the place. It's all dependent on what ending is there. You don't know sometimes what a direct object is until you've gone through and looked at the endings. Give you an example of it, and then that'll be that. Uh, if you ever hear Russian being translated into English, listen to the English translator. And he'll be going along, and all of a sudden he stops. And he'll sort of... Um, uh, and then you go on. And you say, well, doesn't he know the language? Why is he a professional translator? And he has to stumble, it seems. It seems he's stumbling. He's not stumbling. Because Russian was put together by Greeks. Greeks made the Russian alphabet. And Russia, w Russian works the same way in communicating that Greek does. He's stopping because he's trying to let the original speaker in Russian get to the endings on those words so he'll know whether he's saying uh, what he's talking about. He can't, he can't translate it till he hears the Russian. Well, those words in Russian can be put all over the place. And he can't make that translation till he has the wherewithal to make it. And he doesn't have the wherewithal to make it till he hears the endings on those words. We don't have that problem. So... I would say one of the best things you can do in the study of the Bible and looking up words beyond reading and understanding the English text is, and again, this is individually, is it look up just the meaning of the words. There's some good stuff out there that will help the English reader and that will keep you from jumping off the precipice and making claims that, that won't work. Because this, this, that's a different story. Brother, Brother Roy Deaver was one of the best Greek knowledgeable men we had around. And he used to laugh and say, some preachers walk up to me and say, well, I know a little Greek. He'd say, yeah, I know a little Greek. He owns a pizza shop. So, so you know, it, it's just one of those things. And I don't pretend to be able to, to know all the grammar in the sense of just working it. Just, it's there just like English. So watch that. But I'm encouraging you, since this is the study of the Scriptures, right and dividing the Word of Truth, ascertaining Bible authority, becoming familiar with the text, do that. One more thing. Get a text that's reliable. Now here, we, the elders decided a long time ago, King James, New King James, American Standard, 1901. And that would be what we would use in public readings and preaching. Now, somebody said, well, aren't there other versions that are, that are just as good? Well, there may be. Uh, there are some. Nobody's trying to say one English version is perfect in its Greek translation. That's just not so. Uh, it, that is just not so. 
because you can't translate some Greek words or the way it is in grammar in equivalent English words. You can't do it. It won't work. It's not. You can't even do that in modern languages. So um, uh, you you need to be with something you're familiar with. I stay with the old King James because that's what I grew up in. That's what I'm familiar with. I have no problem with the New King James. I switch back and forth at home a lot of times. I, I do a lot of things at home that, as far as the reading of the scriptures. Uh, but to use publicly, I do that. Now, I think it's transitioning among faithful brethren to more of the New King James probably than it was even 20 years ago. But those transitions come slow. You might be for, uh, come slow, but you might be surprised that when the King James Version first appeared in 1611 in England, it was almost a century before the people started making that the common Bible they used. And it helps to study sometimes the history of the English Bible just to see how slow it is and why. You get familiar with the text of a, of a certain version, and that's what you have. You have something to fall back on. You might say, well, here's what I am. it says here, but I'll look at these other versions and see what they say. I have no problem with comparative readings. You, need to, you do need to know something about the philosophy behind the, quote, translators of the different versions because there are different philosophies of translation. But stay with one that you're familiar with, you feel comfortable with. I'll go beyond that. Uh, this was impressed by me by Brother Bales ages ago. He said, a lot of, said, I've seen folks go into debates and they don't want to tear their old ragged regular study Bible with them. They want a real nice new one standing up there in front of everybody. Have you ever opened your Bible because you remember something and you say, it's about here, and you turn a page or two, and there it is? Try that with a new Bible. So my last, uh, he said, take the one you use and are familiar with all the time. Well, that's just good common sense to me. Uh, the last versions I've had, uh, not versions, but Bibles I've had are all the same. I, they're all on the same side of the page. <laughs> this one is a large print. I got that, <laughs> you might guess, as I got older. But I have three others that go all the way back for probably 30 years, the exactly the same thing. And I still have one I haven't got to yet. And I figured probably at this stage of life, I may not even get to that next one. <laughs> but it helps. Any, you talk about what, what are the verses uh, of the Bible, the chapters of the Bible good for? What do they really do? They aid you, don't they, in locating a verse? Well, think for a minute. That's all you're doing by taking the Bible you study all day long every day and working with it so that you can be familiar with it. So a few things like that help, but you can't, over, you can't become overly familiar with the text. And that comes by just reading all the time and thinking about what you read. Okay, so much for all that. I won't charge any extra. If I did, I wouldn't get it anyway. <laughs> so, okay, look at the top of page four. You usually don't talk much about Enoch. And by the way, folks, it's not Enoch it's e or Enoch. It's Enoch. <laughs> Enoch, Genesis 5, 24. And... You notice that the comment that's made in the book is that this showed there's a better place beyond this world. Well, he says, if not, Enoch was cheated. He didn't even get to live all the life he might have lived in the flesh on earth. So, verse 24 of chapter 5 reads, and Enoch Enoch walked with God. What does that mean? When you read that, just first time you ever read it, or second, third, whatever, what does it mean to walk with God? Companions. What is a companion? <laughs> That's right. It's just another way of saying Enoch was faithful to God. He was exemplary in his faithful obedience to God. He was a godly man. Enoch walked with God. But now, notice that carries beyond normally faithfulness here on this earth. Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. He didn't see death. That'd suit me fine. God wouldn't do me 
that way so I wouldn't have to experience the separation of the spirit from the body going through the process of what dying is, physical dying is. So God took him. Well, think of the implications of this. God never intended us to be here forever. Now you say, well, what about before they sinned? They would have been in the Garden of Eden if they hadn't sinned forever. Well, obviously, God being omniscient, and what does that mean? All-knowing, all knows all that is the object of knowledge, that he knew they were going to sin. And thus, provision was made. Let me ask you this. Is there anything God does not know? If it's knowable, is there anything God does not know? Whatever is knowable, does he, is there some part of it he doesn't know? No. All knowledge flows from God. You can say God is knowledge just like say God is love. Uh, everything we have in the Bible is simply the revelation of what's coming from God's mind and specifically as it relates to salvation of man. And as somebody said in the beginning of class, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God, the things that are revealed to us and our children forever. So the revelation of God is primarily aimed at what? The salvation of the souls of men. Don't, ex don't expect every everything in the world in the Bible. Expect one main theme, the salvation of man through Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. That's it. And everything in it is connected with that. If it mentions anything in history or whatever it might mention it in archaeology or whatever, uh, it's only because it connects to the unfolding of the scheme of redemption down through all these times. Now, what, what age are we working in right now? No, in the Bible, in Genesis. Patriarchal age. That's what I'm after. <laughs> Trying to get make sure that's in our mind. Okay, when I say right now, I mean in our study. <laughs> I have to clarify myself. Okay, patriarchal age, the father rule period. God's dealing with man through the heads of families, the fathers. They are the prophets, they are the priests, and God speaks to man that way. No written law, lasted 2,500 years, Genesis 1 1 to Exodus 20, with the giving of the law of Moses to the Jews. Now, this precisely has to do with, of course, the unfolding of the Bible. And it's what you have because of what I said earlier. The Bible is interested in one thing. The revelation of how God saves man and how that was in, done down through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So now we're looking at this time. And you know, God just doesn't take, it just said, well, here, I got a gap here. I got a little space at the end of the page. I'll throw this little tidbit in. No, when he says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Moses, inspired of the Spirit, wrote that. There's a reason that's there. There's information for me there, and it's good for me to know it. First of all, he left the flesh. What do we learn from the New Testament about a, about a spirit from Jesus' own words? Well, Yes, but that's James. I'm talking about what did Jesus in his own, uh, his own words say? A spirit, after his resurrection, a spirit hath not flesh and bones which ye see me have. Meaning that how would you know Christ was raised from the dead if the same body that went in the tomb didn't come out of it? So look at this. Nail scars of my hand and all of this. So... There's a better place for us. Right here in the beginning, there's a better place for us. These people knew that. Remember, all men knew God and believed in Him and followed Him at one time. Then with Cain, you had the example of men who desired not to retain God in their knowledge, who became enemies of God. And, of course, they populate the earth to such a degree that God says, I'll destroy the earth. That's what's about to happen in the next chapter here. But at the time Enoch lived, he was that close with God, so much so that God took him. There's a better place to go in. God took him. Well, we have to, if we know anything else about the Bible on, in the, on this topic, we know that the Spirit returns to God who gave it. That still doesn't tell us more than it enters eternity. Now we have to go to other places in the Scriptures. Can you tell me other verses you already know that might have a bearing on where did Enoch go when, he, when God took him? Okay, all right. 
And this, of course, is the same Holy Spirit that inspired Moses thousands of years later, inspired the writer of the Hebrews. And so he adds a little bit to it that we don't have in Genesis. And we run into that several times. Remember Abraham, we learned what he thought when God commanded him to offer Isaac. Since everything that God had promised him depended on Isaac living, Abraham thought, well, he'll raise him up from the ashes. That's not said in the Old Testament. That's said in the New Testament. But what difference does it make? God wrote the Bible. Let's keep that in mind. God wrote the Bible. And let me ask this. What is time to God? Nothing. So whether he wrote it in the years that Moses lived or in the years that Paul lived, those years meant nothing to him. It's an unfolding. It's a revelation of the mind of God, specifically as the Bible is concerned, relative to the salvation of man. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make, and we have to write ourselves constantly, is that we tend to want to think of God as a man, that he is, he's uh, bound by the things that bind us. He's limited by the things. That's a wrong thing to do. It's just this, it's a bad thing to do. God there in eternity creates time and space and material things and all things connected therewith and necessary to make it run. But he's in eternity, and he can see the end from the beginning and all particulars down through time. Even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Not a sparrow falls, he doesn't know. Imagine that. And when you think of the DNA of your own body, and that, you know, they've got those spiral chains that represent it and go all. Just think he knows every little, small, minute, microscopic <laughs> detail of everything's DNA. When Jesus, or, uh, or, or uh, John said in his work in preceding the Christ to prepare the Jews, and the Pharisees are sent to find out who he is, say not to yourselves, he said to them, that we have Abraham to our father. And then what did he say? For God can, from these rocks, raise up children unto Abraham. Now, most of the time we read that and take just the face value of it. Well, what did he really say there? He can take the DNA of that rock and so arrange it to make a descendant of Abraham just like you are. After all, does the Bible say, from the dust of the ground, he made man. So we need to understand this is the being that our minds, when you start trying to think about these things, my mind sometimes feels like a ping pong ball bouncing back and forth trying to grasp. That's the reason, the, and you remember Nancy, I said in the Godhead class that one thing will come out of this knowing is that what we don't know, we probably can't know. Because it's, it, how do you figure something that never had a beginning or ending? Or a being whose very nature means you didn't have beginning or ending. Now, on top of that, the essence of God is in three persons. Uh, that, I can understand the fact of that, but fathoming what it really means, I don't know. So, when you see Enoch walk with God and he was not, for God took him, I start wanting to think more about, well, what does the rest of the Bible say about something like that? Well, further regarding where Enoch may have gone when he, his spirit left the body, which he didn't die, but... Uh, he, there was a great transition. People talk about transitions. Here's a transition. And God, it was all brought about by God for this one man. Where did he go? He went to eternity. To heaven. What does that mean? You mean there's, there's human beings in the very presence of God right now? <laughs> Think about it for a minute. Where in the Bible would you go to to prove there are human beings in the very presence of God right now? When I say presence of God, I mean heaven is a place. It's not like a place here, but it's a place. God's in that place. You have Jesus described at the right hand of God sitting and ruling. It's a place. It can't be like a place here. It's not physical, it's not rule of time, not physical laws and so forth. What do we have in the Bible that tells us something about spirits when they leave this world? Where do they go? 
That's exactly right. The King James Version had it translated. The King James Version had it translated hell. Hades. Mm-hmm. American Standard has Hades. I think King, New King James has Hades, or does it? Yes. It does have Hades. How, by the way, Ken, you brought up this one time. How many, how many uh, uh, whoever may know, uh, editions of the New King James gone through? I couldn't remember. Uh, by the way, the old, what we call the Old King James is a, what, a, John fourth, fourth revision or seventh revision of what it was. If you ever pick up the sixteen eleven, you you'll see what kind of revision ours really is. <laughs> yeah, seventy something like that. Well, back to what was brought up in Luke sixteen, rich man and Lazarus. What do we learn from that about? Death. Remember, he didn't die. Enoch did not die. The spirit fathered by God put into him when he was conceived is still there. It's never going to cease to be. Right, it had to go to paradise. The place, uh, if we take the rest of what the Bible says, and that's what I'm trying to do regarding when a, when a person who's innocent, a babe, a child, a person not responsible for their thoughts and actions, innocent, never sinned, where do they go when they die? Along with faithful Christians. They go into paradise. People have always done that. That's the reason I said, where in the Bible would you go to show that people right now are in the very presence of God in heaven where Jesus is sitting and ruling the right hand of God? They're not. When is that going to take place, folks? After the judgment, at the resurrection, and so on. We need to understand that. By the way, notice how many times in our songs, and you probably haven't noticed it, but uh, notice how many times in a lot of the songs we sing, uh, we have people that have died already in heaven with the angels singing and all that kind of stuff. I know what they're saying. You know, the idea they're in paradise, they're in happiness, and and the word paradise itself in, in, the, in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, will refer to heaven where God is. But paradise in Luke 16, the rich man of Lazarus, is referring to that part of the Hadean world where saved people go and innocent people go. The great gulf fixed. And then uh, the uh, place of torment, Tartarus, in the Greek is there where the rich man, which indicates all wicked people go there. In paradise, they're heaven bound, and otherwise they're not. Some people say, well, well, what about the judgment then? How, how can they already be tormented for their sins and comforted, as Abraham said of Lazarus? There, well, we, we have a false concept of the judgment. That's why. Judgment is not a determination of who's going to heaven and who's not. Judgment is a passing of sentence on the basis of what's already been determined. You cannot have a complete and final judgment while this earth is continuing. Why? They continue to, to impact even after you're long gone. What do you have in Hebrews 11 concerning Abel? He being dead, yet speaketh. What does that say about your life? Do you remember folks that have long been dead in your life and your family or friends or members of the church? Do you still remember them and how they lived and what they did? You may remember some as bad folks. You may remember some not. Well, as you remember them, are they impacting you? But more than that, what about books written that we depend on? Anybody ever hear of J.W. McGarvey? He's been dead since the early 1900s. And yet everybody, well, I say everybody, a great many people, especially faithful brethren, still refer to his commentaries. So what's, what's J.W. McGarvey doing? He being dead yet? Speaketh. He still teaches. Um, any article written, any sermon recorded, 
As long as we're dead, it's still teaching people. And thus, how can I be judged or you be judged until there's no longer a place for you to influence folks for good or bad? And thus, we're judged according to our works only when our works have ceased to, either for good or bad, have influence here on this earth. Well, that can't happen to this earth ends. And that's where God places the judgment. So we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. The, think, think of the impact that, uh, well, for one example, think of the impact that Karl Marx and uh, Lenin are still having on people through their communist doctrine. They're still influencing people. And on and on you can go. You can look at all kinds of philosophers and people that still influence folks. So when there has to be an end to that place where those things can influence before those people can be completely judged. And that's true even of godly people. There still has to be an end to the influence you left behind. Whether it's through writing, through people remember your example, or whatever. How many times in your life have you said, well, I remember so-and-so saying this? Well, you can think of somebody, and they made an impression on you. I don't know what impression... Some people do make on other folks, but they make an impression on them. So what I'm trying to get you to see is, is that Enoch, way back there in the patriarchal age, no written rule for them to follow, worshiping God at altars, the head of the family, the patriarch, the father, also called call the father rule period, is directing all affairs. Enoch lived with God, knew God, and was taken by God to be with him. I'd like to know more about Enoch. He didn't have the information we have. But what he had, he lived up to it. So much so that God took him. I, my curiosity says, what made him different? Because I know how Abraham is later on. He's pictured as the father of the faithful. God never took him. <laughs> that wasn't his purpose. So where did he take him to? He took him to eternity. Where in eternity? It has to be in the Hadean world, place of departed spirits, Awaiting the end of time. When, they, when men on earth at the end of time will be brought up, uh, changed. Uh, you know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, that in the moment of twinkling an eye will be changed. That's not the blink of the eye. That's a glint of, of, uh, of light across your eyeball. That's the twinkle. That quick, you know, there won't be any. If, if it happened right now, it would just all of a sudden be, and there would be no time for anything. So that's when that will happen, and the people on earth alive at that time will be changed, the faithful people. But the Lord talked about a resurrection of the just and the unjust. So it's not just the righteous who will be resurrected, but the just. Now, when you read your New Testament, I want you to notice this. When you have the resurrection body discussed, it rarely mentions anything about the resurrected body of the lost. It zeroes in on describing the resurrected body of the saved. So I don't know how that resurrected body will be for the lost. They won't have the glorification that the resurrected body of the saved will have. Because John says we do not know what we should be like, but we shall be like him, speaking of Christ. So we will have the glorified body Christ now has. So when man enters heaven, he will be glorified humanity. Uh, tell me what that means. I can't do any better than what I just did. And the Bible doesn't try to tell us. When you try to describe the meaning of the word glorification, or when you say glory, that's a, I don't know, it's like hallelujah as a description of praise. You can't, I don't know that you can define it that well, except that say hallelujah is a description of praise, glory is a description of the state of affairs of uh, God, and of our resurrected state as faithful people on the day of judgment. So this basically is telling us, because we can have other scriptures to help us on this, there is a better place. God took him from this place and put him in that place. And that's a better place. But where did he put him? Well, we have to go to other places in the Bible. That's what it comes down to. And we have to understand the Hadean world as best we can, and all we can do is understand the revelation of it. 
And Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Verily I say unto thee today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise? So Christ went where Lazarus went, in paradise. And the thief went with him that day. Notice how little words make such a difference. Verily I say unto thee, Christ speaking to the thief, who said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He says, Verily I say unto thee today, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. How would that comfort the thief? What's the significance in the meaning of the word with in Christ's pronouncement? Verily I say unto thee today, verily truly it's a fact. I say unto thee today, shalt thou, thief, who has to be remembered when I come into my kingdom, be with me, Christ, where? In a place beyond this life called paradise. Some of the doctrines of people say that when man dies, he goes totally unconscious. Knows nothing. What does that tell us? Just that one passage. What does it tell us about what we know don't know? By the little word with. How many people here have had surgery to where you had to be completely put out? Knocked out. Unconscious. Oh, Jansa. Or a few of you have. Who's with you and who was in that room when you were having your surgery? Who? How do you know that? You you because be, be, because because the because the procedure would not have happened without your being. Okay, but but I can't tell you. I know for sure it was Doctor Winkelstein and what did the nurses? Well, if Winkelstein, we we <laughs> <laughs> the point I'm making is before you went to sleep, before you became unconscious. You may have looked around you and seen people. A lot of times the doctor's actually going to do the surgery. He's not even in there until you're after you're knocked out. The point I'm saying is with means you'll be aware that you're with me in this given place. That's the significance of what Christ said. Yeah, and, and verily I say unto the today, uh, dear, this day, as far as earth is concerned, which sure told him, you're going to be, how long did these people stay on the cross many times they were crucified? Anybody know? A lot of times those folks hung for days on those crosses. But Christ said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. What did that tell the thief? And, and that's exactly right. How did, how, did that ki how did that kill him? How did that cause him to die fast? He couldn't suffocate. He couldn't suffocate. Part of the agony of the cross is when they, they wouldn't crucify you when they just stretch you straight out. They pull, they pull your legs up to where you could raise yourself up and down on that nail. They intend to torture you, make you hurt as long as possible. And, and with a nail like this, then you, have you ever been desperate to get a breath? You had that breath knocked out of you. There's a, for a split second, there's a, <laughs> you gasp, you know, you just, well, when they're hanging by those arms for hurting so bad, the pectoral muscles under here, there's a science to crucifixion. They get to where they, you can't breathe. And, and you're willing to stand the pain of lifting yourself up on those nails through your feet just to get a breath. So why did they break their legs? They can't do that, and they die pretty quickly. The thief understood all about that. These folks weren't ignorant of crucifixion and what it did to them. He knew then, I won't be here tomorrow or the next day. I'll be leaving this world today, which is quite unusual for crucifixion. But where, who will be with me? You will be with Christ. Christ said you would be with him. You will be with Christ. Where? In a place called paradise. There's a lot said in that verse. A whole lot said in that verse. And the little word with is very important to shut people up about going completely unconscious the moment you die. Because how would the thief know he was with Christ if he was unconscious when he died? 
Well, it's very important. We're with one another now. How do we know that? We're conscious. We're capable of working as conscious people and know who we're with. And it's good to, to talk about thinking about words. Read that uh, and just think about it. And you can see those words carry with it a lot of meaning that's not ex explicitly stated, but by implication you can see it. What does it mean to be with somebody? You're aware, fully aware. And it's going to be in a state called paradise and a place called paradise. And thus Abraham would say of Lazarus, he's now comforted. So there's comfort in paradise, the place of departed spirits, where we will await the resurrection call. How long will you stay in paradise? That's the only answer, because you can't measure it now by time, because you're outside of time. What laws of this present world work in paradise? How long had Abraham been dead when Lazarus reached the place of comfort or paradise? Well, even more than that. Uh, been dead about, about Oh, let's see, 2,500 years, something like that. Somewhere along the way, don't hold me to the day or the year. What does the rich man see when he gets looking across that great gulf and he's in torment? What does he see? How do you see him? He doesn't have eyeballs. He doesn't have a body. How do you see him? How does he know Abraham's spirit from another spirit? Did they go through an introduction process all around? <laughs> so you begin to see this whole thing after you leave this world is so different. It's hardly comparable. Other than we as individual persons will still keep what we are. We will still be what we are. And we have our memory with us about our time on earth because what was the whole discussion about with the rich man two things help me send Lazarus over well I can't do that so then what does he say yeah when he left here he knew there were five brethren back here who could still make the change he just wants extra special help word of God didn't mean anything to them it's not going to mean anything uh, or to him it won't mean anything to them because so what does he ask for And what does Abraham tell him? Yeah, if you won't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will you hear one who's risen from the dead. Of course, Christ is going to rise from the dead. How many people are running over themselves to hear Christ? So the point I, I'm saying is when you read a few words like, and Enoch walked with God after he began Methuselah and so on, and then all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years and then Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. There's a lot said there when you start thinking about the implications of what's said, and especially when you draw from your knowledge of other places in the Bible dealing with what a person is, what a human being is, what happens at death. Now, there's no way you can discern all of that from just this one verse without other knowledge of the Bible dealing with the same topic. But we're not trying to do that. It helps us to understand even the makeup of man, how we're put together. We have a spirit fathered by God that will never cease. And may I make this warning before we leave this point. It is true that our spirits fathered by God infused in us, for lack of a better way to put it, at conception, will never cease to be. But it's wrong to call that, ce that never ceasing to be of the spirit that is in torment and that eventually is raised to corruption, how that works, I don't know, to be in hell forever, to say they're alive. What does the Bible call hell? The what? The second death. They exist, but we shouldn't call it life. Eternal life is more than mere existence. The people in hell have existence. 
So what makes eternal life eternal life? It's quality of life. It's the quality that glorification has in heaven and what God does for us. So don't fall into the trap to say that to use the... Uh, Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Where the Bible speaks, we speak, and so on. So don't call people alive when you mean to say they exist and they're still center of personalities. Because death carries basic with it this definition, separation. The body, apart from the spirit, is dead. It doesn't mean unconsciousness. It doesn't mean annihilation. It means that you leave this body in the case of Enoch here, and you go into eternity, a complete different state of existence and being. Now, obviously, God did not intend the human spirit to be outside of a body because he's going to put us back in one. For those who die lost the resurrection of corruption. Those who die saved, glorification in a body like the Lord presently has. That's a state of existence, but you're separated from God. Hell is a place that people choose to go to, just like heaven is a place people choose to go to. So if you don't want God, if you don't care about God, if you're going to have it your way, if you're going to deny the existence of God, if you're going to worship falsely, if you're going to live contrary to the Bible, then you're saying, I don't have anything to do with you, God. And God says, I've got a place for you where you're totally separated from me. That's what makes hell, hell. That's why it can be called where the worm dieth not, where the fire is not quenched, yet it can be called outer darkness. Outer darkness. Darkness is darkness. What's outer darkness? Well, it's where dark really gets dark. <laughs> and imagine, somebody says, well, how can you have a flame and have outer darkness? Well, that's falling back on how we judge things here. I heard one fellow say, well, if you can't understand that, can it get hot in the oven and you never see the flame? <laughs> Would it be awful dark? Point is, this is describing things to us as we can understand them now. Because what is, the, what is the Bible here for? To accommodate us as God made us. God communicates to us the way he prepared us to understand. That's what we've got to understand about the Bible. It's for us. It's God communicating to us on our level of understanding. Do you ever engage in baby talk with kids? Why do you do that? Why do we have classes teaching little and a little bigger on a class? Why do we do that? How much would the, would the uh, five-year-olds get out of this class this morning in here? Well, your kid's a bunch of dunces, ignoramuses. You teach them on their level of understanding. And that's important to understand when it comes to, to God speaking to us. If we can understand that among our own selves, then why can't we understand when God created us like he made us and to come to knowledge like we do, that he communicated to us on our own level of understanding and ability to understand. And so study to show thyself approved unto God, a work when they need not to be ashamed, handling right the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. He expects out of us what we can do, but he supplies for us what we can't do. Now, where did the Bible come from? It came from God. And because he chose to give it to us the way he did, doesn't mean it didn't come from God. But who was it given to? Us. So if it's given to us, it's fitted to us, isn't it? Do your clothes fit you? Why would you say sometimes better than others? Why are you concerned about the way your clothes fit? <laughs> Point is, you look for clothes that will fit you at least as you are now. They may not be January, but <laughs> at least as you are now. Well, God made us a certain way. He's not going to operate contrary to the way he made us. God does all things decently and in order. So when he made us as we are to come to understanding, then he communicates it with us the same way. 
And that's, that's not hard to understand when you look at how much we're taught in the Bible, to read the Bible, to understand the Bible, to meditate on, on the Bible, to look at ourselves honestly in the light of the Bible. Whoso looketh at the perfect law of liberty continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in his deeds. So uh, James 1.25 makes it clear. We're to appear, we're to understand, we're to think. So when you come to a little verse like uh, Enoch, walking with God, what it means to walk with God in the patriarchal age, long before the flood. This is before the flood, remember that. And he was not, was not where? Was not on this earth, for God took him. Notice he took him. He, he took him like I would take this on a human level. I take my water with me. But he took him. He didn't say he ceased to be. He took him. And we learn from the rest of the Bible where he took him to be. And that's where he still is, by the way, awaiting the do a judgment day. Any comments or questions? Have they broken over there, John? Okay. Give me a high sign when they're moving out. <laughs> Any comments or questions on this? Anything you'd like to add? I, I'm trying to milk this for all it's worth, but that's why that's in here. Uh, where did he go? And then uh, he cites... Uh, Oh, and by the way, uh, I can't remember now. J.D. pointed this out to me, and I didn't uh, last week. I may have to wait he gets back. I can't remember right where it was now. But anyway, I'll try to remember that. There's a, there's a correction that needs to be made in the booklet as far as the Scripture text. I can't remember right now. Any comments, questions? All right, when you leave here and you get over there, you'll still be the same person over there you were here. <laughs> and under your own power, you'll be taking you from here and going over there, and you will not be here, but you will be over there. <laughs> so, yes, ma'am. Well, we have to ask that question, what is death? Well, he just took his spirit. He didn't undergo the process of death. So his body was well, it, yes, his body would be left back here. He didn't take his body. Unless he... Tra unless he uh, well, the only reason I'm saying that... Well, no, it doesn't say it. You can't get all of it out of this one verse. That's the reason I've been going over the other verses. But he took him, and he was not. But uh, he can't, you can't take the, the physical body into the Hadean world. It's not meant for that. But that's the very point I'm making. You're still you when you're outside this body. That's why I spent time as I did in, uh, with Lazarus and the rich man Abraham. They, I don't know how they identified them, but there's no body there. There's no picture to look at. So there's a knowledge that goes beyond physical descriptions and knowledge. Uh, I don't know how that works. I don't pretend to. Just let me get there so I can experience it. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's what when it said this is the very point he did not go through the process of getting old or getting sick or whatever and dying God relieved him of that and think about it on the day when we when the world comes to an end Christians it, what does it say about those still alive on the earth they'll be changed so they won't experience death like probably well, I won't say probably because I don't know when the world's coming back uh, like we've seen people. Experience and most people do. Dead. So, so similar um, to Enoch, um, Jesus died on the cross, but when, when he ascended into heaven, he didn't, he didn't go through that aging or physical death process. But it had to be something similar to what. Obviously, there was a radical change in the physical body of Christ from when he left the earth to heaven because of what we already said. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. He was flesh and blood. The same body went in that tomb. The same body came out of it in the resurrection. But when he ascends back to God, there had to be a change. Because then when you find him discussed later on, he's in a glorified state. He's in the body, but he's glorified state. This is a very important point I've made several times, and we'll have to quit.
Uh, once Christ took upon himself the form of human humanity, he never did best himself. That's how much Jesus gave us to be like us. Instead, he elevates us up to his status. Or else John's words make no sense. We do not know what we shall be like. We shall be like him. Well, you can't become deity. Deity doesn't become, he is. Well, then in what way will we be like Christ when we raise the dead? Well, read verse 15. You're sown in corruption. We're raised in incorruption. So we'll be glorified humanity. We will be like Christ in eternity in that we'll be glorified even as Christ now is. Well, that should give us even greater desire. All we do in the church today in submitting to him is preparing ourselves for that state. And by the grace of God and our faithfulness, we get to, and he makes this great transition on our part. They have a commonality from the standpoint of uh, the humanity, and they have a human spirit, and that spirit's now in the Hadean world. In the process of changing, God did their changing without them undergoing the same thing. I'm just picking out Enoch before that, because that's early stone back in patriarchal age, before the flood, that Enoch was taken by God. But man doesn't change as far as the way he's made. <coughs> They're out. I am too.